This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful online presence and run your business. Welcome back, everyone. Today, we're gonna do a Lens Days video, and I wanna talk about manual focusing techniques. I've done a lot of Lens Days videos, and by very much a popular request, in the next couple weeks, next couple months, I want to start getting into some older manual focus lenses that have really specifically interesting characteristics that you can employ into your photography. And I wanna talk about using these lenses with modern cameras. But I think before we get into that, I thought it would be great to do a video just talking about manual focusing techniques, how I set my camera up, which may not be earth shattering to some of you. You probably already use some of these. But I also wanna talk about how I set my computer up because one thing that drives me nuts is when files don't have the right metadata on them. The way I organize my Lightroom catalog is I create smart collections by lens and by camera. And because I do do a lot of camera reviews, a lot of lens reviews, I need to be able to go find things. And when you're dealing with older manual focus lenses, let's say you've got like, on this camera, I've got like this old Nikon lens, which is a great lens, but it was never designed to go on this body, and this body was never really designed to see this lens, and so you don't get any metadata about aperture or what the lens is. Well, there's an app that you can use, and I wanna show you how I sort a little bit of that out. So welcome to the Lens Days video, and we're gonna talk about manual focus. A lot of this was actually inspired by this lens that I'm using, which is a Voigtlander. This is a 50 millimeter APO Lanthar F2 lens. That's not brand new, but it's kind of new to me and it's something I got curious about. I will say this is one of my favorite 50 millimeter lenses ever made for any system. It is just absolutely beautiful. And I wanted to do a review on this, and a lot of my review has to do with how easy I actually found manual focus. I'm one of those people who uses autofocus quite a bit, especially since I've been on the Sony system and they have such a great autofocus system. But once I figured a few things out, this actually became really easy to do and pretty second nature. And honestly, since I've been using the Voigtlander and I've gotten used to manual focus, I've found that I'm actually pulling my G Master lenses and my native Sony lenses, and I turn autofocus off in certain circumstances just because it's easier for me to manually pick the focus point. And I think that's something that just, it's another skill that as photographers, we have to understand when to use the tools that we have. Now, as I mentioned, I'm someone who loves autofocus. And I think especially in the last 10 years, we've seen leaps and bounds with autofocus technology, in particular, the move to mirrorless. Sony are the leader with this. When you look at something like the system with the A9 and the right lenses, and you're able to like autofocus, you know, some crazy amount. Of, it's like, it's almost real time how it's focusing. This is a huge boon for video and it's also a huge boon for sports photography. And I think it's great. And I think any of the major brands now have incredible IAF. It doesn't matter what you're using, Fujifilm, Canon, Nikon, Sony, they all do an amazing job with eye autofocus. However, there are times where I'm not shooting a human being, maybe it's a little more abstract in nature, the shot that I have set up, and I need to just be able to not have the camera early arbitrarily select something or have to like lock on to the focus tracking in the middle. It's just easier for me to go into manual focus and get the shot the old school way. But first, let's talk about adapters for a second because this is actually an important part of this equation. Now, typically you can go on Amazon or you go on B&H or Adorama or wherever you like to buy camera gear and you look for adapters. And this is one of the things that it, when I initially got my first mirrorless camera, which was the Sony NEX7, it was really cool because all of a sudden I have this wide range of choices of older lenses lenses that I could adapt. Back then, Sony didn't have a really good selection of lenses. Everything was a lot newer. And so this was a huge selling point on the system. So I've owned a lot of adapters and they are not all created equal. The adapter that's on here right now, this is the old Sony Nikkor S 50 millimeter F 1.4, which is actually a really cool lens. But I've got this on a Photosay, I think is how you say it, Photosay adapter. These are usually the ones you find that come in at these unbelievable price points. I also want to note that in general, you're going to get what you pay for. So I'm sorry, Sorry if anybody from Photosay is watching this video right now, but even though these are very affordable, I found that they're in general pretty flimsy. The brand I would recommend is actually this one, and this is actually on a lens right now. This is a Novaflex. You're going to see a huge price change between Novaflex and Photosay, and Novaflex are definitely the most robust in terms of build, and you're gonna get what you pay for it. Now, here's the thinking, and here's the mentality that, that, and I've done it too, is that let's say you've got some old $50 Canon FD lenses or Nikon lenses and you want to use them and so you go online I need an adapter and you go through the list and you're like oh here's one for like 20 bucks and here's one for 250 
and you like do the double take and it's like the whole psychology of buying a $250 adapter. I'm just throwing these numbers out. These are expensive though, but you're buying an expensive adapter to put on an under $50 lens. It's just doesn't match up, but you have to think of it beyond that, that this will mount multiple lenses and you do get what you pay for. Essentially I've found even the photo says, I mean, they will work. I've never had one that was like not aligned correctly or slightly the wrong length. I mean, I get full focus functionality out of any lens, but that is something to be aware of is that you do get what you pay for. Novaflex is my preferred go-to these days, and this is kind of all I buy. I do have some photo saves from the old days, but kind of replacing them right now. Let's talk about how I set up the camera. Now, I'm using Sony's in this example, but this same approach applies to whatever you're using. So if you're a Canon shooter, you're going to be able to do the same stuff by signing custom buttons and setting it up the same way. If you're a Fujifilm user, it doesn't matter. I'm just using this as the example, so take notes of what we're doing on here. So one thing I will say about Sony's, though, and if you're a Sony shooter, you know I'm talking about. So if you're using Voigtlander or Zeiss or any of the companies that make manual focus lenses that are native to E-mount. In other words, this is a Voigtlander lens that works directly to E-mount. I don't have to adapt it. It also passes the EXIF metadata through into the camera. So it will record what lens, what aperture, the whole thing. That's really nice, but they also have a feature that by default in Sony cameras is just annoying to no end. As soon as you turn the focus dial, it kicks into what we call manual focus assist, which essentially zooms in for critical focus into the middle of the screen. This is fine for certain types of photography, but I just am annoyed beyond belief. I, I can't deal with it because first of all, it just distracted me into where am I in the image? Then I have to move the joystick or the dial around to move that. And I'm not even paying attention to my composition anymore. And by the time I'm oriented, if you're trying to shoot street photography or something of that nature, the moment's gone. Even if you're trying to shoot just candids of relatives or family members, it's the moment's over. So so I set them up a very different way. By default, I turn that off. Now, manual focus assist is a great functionality and it is great for like landscapes or something where you're set up and you want to check out critical focus or you're doing product photography, let's say. What I do is I reassign that to one of the top function keys. So I can get back to it. I turn it off by default, but if I press C2, then I can go into critical focus. And actually when you go in that way, it asks you before it zooms in, where do you want to zoom in to? So it's just a much better way to work. So you're probably thinking, Ted, you must have incredible eyes if you can just focus off the screen. Well, little secret, I don't. It's called getting older, but fortunately there is a remedy for this and it is called focus peaking. And what focus peaking allows you to do is when you have this turned on is it adds a layer of highlight and you can change the color. I have mine set to white, but you can change it to red or green or depending on what your camera supports. And this allows me to see the area that's in focus. It looks for high contrast areas in the image and allows me to focus in and I, this is the fastest way to work because once you get used to this, you can dial focus in right on the eyes. You can focus in right on whatever it is that you're trying to do in the composition. It really doesn't take that much time at all. Sure, it's not as fast as autofocus, but it is pretty accurate and it's fast enough. And it's fast enough certainly for using manual focus or especially older manual focus lenses. So the way I have my camera set up is I use custom function dials to be able to turn things on and off. So I already mentioned the first one. Well, the second one won't work right now because I have a manual focus lens already on here, but see three over here on the top left is what I do for my focus selection. So if I'm using a G Master lens, let's say, and I, I'm in autofocus and I want to turn it off, that's where I do it. I can bounce back and forth between the two. So you'll get manual focus or the very different flavors of, of autofocus that, that you have as options. The second thing I do is I assign a button for turning peaking on and off. And what I do is I use, actually it's the control dial on the back. I don't know if you know this, but on Sony cameras, there's actually four buttons that you can turn that into. So I just have the bottom one. So I'm going to press that once. We're going to turn peaking off and then I can turn peaking on. And so that's a great way that if I, for some reason, don't want it, then I can turn it off. You can bounce back and forth. The other option that I like to do, and this is a little bit annoying about Sony cameras, they will do animal IAF and human IAF, but not at the same time. So I set that toggle to the trash can. And so when I hit the trash can, when I'm not in review mode, it will toggle back and forth between human and animal IAF. So anyway, that's how I set my camera up. I think it's also important to be consistent. So I own several Sony's, so it's 
a little bit of a pain, but I go set it up this way on every camera. That way, whatever I'm shooting, I can do it quickly. And I think that's the name of the game is understanding how to manual focus using levels peaking. And then also you want to be able to learn how to do it really quick. And so consistency is key on this. So I mentioned the Voigtlander lenses and even the Zeiss Loxia lenses, which are manual focus. They're designed to work with Sony cameras. Well, they will pass all the EXIF communication to the camera. So this is aperture information, the make and model of the lens. If you're using something like this, the Nikkor S, F 50 millimeter F4. Well, this is completely foreign. There's no communication happening in here at all. You just have basically have a metal tube here. It's an adapter that doesn't have any data that passes through it. So how do we get this to show up correctly in Lightroom or Capture One or whatever it is that we're doing? Well, that's what I want to get into next. But real quick, I want to give a shout out to our sponsor today, who are the awesome folks over at Squarespace.com. Present your photography using Squarespace's modern professional portfolios. The layouts are completely customizable and you can use Squarespace Squarespace's drag and drop based backend system, which is really easy to use to present your work the way that you want it seen. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform for building beautiful websites, easily claiming your domain or URL, and creating a custom site that brings your ideas to life. Squarespace is host to a number of other tools, including e-commerce, appointment scheduling, and analytics so that you can grow your brand and your following. So head over to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, you can go to squarespace.com slash AOP to save an additional 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Once again, that is squarespace.com slash AOP. And I want to thank the folks at Squarespace for sponsoring another episode of The Art of Photography. So let's talk about metadata and Cro-Magnon lenses for just a second. So the way that I have Lightroom set up that's really important to the way that I work is I need to be able to look at images by lens or by camera model. And so the way I set this up in my Lightroom catalog is by using smart collections. So you you set up a smart collection and you give it some metadata criteria to consider. And what it'll do is any image in your entire catalog that meets that criteria will sit in that smart collection. And so it's really easy and obvious to do by camera model or even by lens. And the problem that I have here is that like with an old lens, like this Nikkor lens, there is no metadata. The lens make or lens model field is completely blank. And so you would think, well, I'll just go into Lightroom and I'll change that data. And well, guess what? For reasons unbeknownst to me that I can't even fathom, you can't. It's actually something that I would like to ask Adobe next time I have the opportunity. And there must be a reason because that's actually fairly common. Most photo editors do not let you access or manipulate or change certain data fields, but I just need to change the lens field. So the workaround that I found for this is by using an app called Exif Editor. Now this is on the Mac side of things. There probably is a Windows equivalent. I don't know off the top of my head. If any of you do, uh, feel free to drop a comment below and share with others but this is what I do. So EXIF Editor allows me to go in. You can drag and drop and bring in images and you can just change metadata fields in there. And so what I do is I create presets and I do them for each lens that I use frequently. And so what you do is you do this on import. This is very important because if you don't do this on import, then it's hard to find these images later. So step one is I go ahead, I put a card in and I bring images into Lightroom. And you know, you see your recently imported images folder. So what I do is I right click on any one of those images and I say show in finder and this opens up a finder window with the images in them. Then I can drag and drop all of my images. I drag and drop them onto EXIF editor. I apply a preset and then I hit save and it's going to go through and it's just going to do nothing but alter the metadata. And I only have the one field set up and it's the lens name. You got to give it a name and you got to know what it is because then you can create your smart folder in Lightroom. Now the next step you have to do is you have to come back to Lightroom and then when you're in that images folder, nothing gets applied dynamically. So you have to select all of the images that you just brought in. You're going to right click, you're going to go down to metadata, and you're going to go read from file. What this is going to do is give you a little warning. They'll say, hey, if you've done any edits, they're going to go away. And unfortunately, that's the case. So this is another reason why you want to do it when you import images before you start to edit things. But anyway, this will go ahead and update all the metadata fields and then you can create your smart collections and then you can have them display there. So that is my method of working. Now this sounds complex, but I promise once you have it set up and you have your camera set up the right way with your custom function keys so you can get to things quickly, manual focus shooting can be a lot of fun. It can be easy to catalog and it makes it just kind of a joy to work with some of these cool older lenses that have a lot of 
character to them. So this is one thing we're going to be doing moving forward, and I'm pretty excited about it because over the next couple weeks, I want to start talking about older lens characteristics, how they differ from modern lenses, why you would want to shoot with something like this, and I can spoil it for you now. Some of these lenses have some really amazing character to them. So I would love to know what you guys think. Drop me a comment below. I'll see you guys in the next video. Until then, later.